It's an honor to be invited to testify once more on this important issue of the disappearances, forced conversions, and forced marriages of Coptic women and girls. I'd like to express my thanks to this commission for holding this hearing and for launching our new report. It's a real honor uh, that you've accorded us. I would also like to express my appreciation and my thanks to Dr. John Eibner of Christian Solidarity International for championing the issue and sponsoring the research and writing of this report. I would also like to express my thanks to my co-author, Nadia Ghali, for her invaluable uh, collaboration. She's not able to be with us today. I have submitted written testimony along with the newly released report and would like these to be included in the permanent record of the hearings. Now, without objection, your full statement and that of Dr. Waleed and all statements will be made a part of the record. Thank you. My introductory remarks will be brief, highlighting our principal conclusions and recommendations, but I'd also like to address some of the challenges raised by individuals and organizations who would seek to downplay the seriousness of the issue. First, a little bit of context and then the challenges. This report builds upon our previous work from 2009 in which we documented the disappearances of Coptic women and girls. Many were lured into false relationships through fraudulent means or forcible abductions. These women were coerced into converting to Islam and married to their abductors against their wills. Our report was based on interviews with women who had been abducted, the lawyers who represented them, and family members of women who had not yet returned. But the report was greeted with some mixed response. We're grateful to you and to this commission, which one year ago, as you mentioned, sponsored a hearing on this important topic to raise the visibility of violence against the Coptic women in Egypt. Other U.S. government bodies were not so receptive. In 2010, the Office to Combat and Monitor Trafficking in Persons uh, refer referenced our study in their annual report, although referring to our findings as allegations. Findings of our current report were not referenced in the 2012 TIP report. The 2010 Department of State's International Religious Freedom Report also refers to our work, once again using the word allegation. There have been some interesting traction in other areas, and for the first time, we're beginning to see stories in the, main, in the mainstream media. In 2010, just before the Christmas holidays, the BBC aired a documentary film on attacks against Christian minorities in Europe, featuring a family whose daughter had been abducted. Uh, they based their research in large part on our first report. In July 2011, the New York Review of Books featured an article by journalist and writer Yasmin El Rashti referencing the disappearance of Coptic girls. And in October 2011, the European Parliament issued a statement condemning violence against the Copts in Egypt and expressed particular concern about girls who have been kidnapped and forced to, con to convert. So we're seeing a little bit of, uh, a little bit of positive response. So why, why doesn't the issue have more traction? Mr. Adderholt asked a very important question. I'd like to talk about this just a little bit before I get into the finding of the reports. Uh, I've been, as you say, in the anti-trafficking world for a long time, and there, there are many parallels. We know enough now from years of studying recruitment strategies of human traffickers that one main way of luring young women into an exploitative relationship is under the guise of a romantic partnership. We also know that if a marriage is forced, it sets up a controlling and coercive environment which can be nothing short of exploitative. Claims that all disappearances are the results of impulsive behavior reflect a deep and potentially dangerous misunderstanding of the use of force, fraud, and coercion that are characteristics of the relationships between the young Coptic girls and their captors. Both my co-author and Nadia Ghali and I recognize that not all disappearances are the re results of abduction, not all marriages are forced, but and notwithstanding the ambiguity of many situations we encountered, we claim that it's not possible to dismiss each case in our 2009 report on the grounds that girls willingly left their families. We will contend the same thing for the report that we present to you today. These are not all cases of romance gone bad. 
So concerned with the escalating violence against Copts in Egypt and dissatisfied with the lack of response from the U.S. government, Christian Solidarity International commissioned a second report, which we are launching here today. This new report substantiates our early findings. In addition, we have observed changes in trends and patterns which reinforce the premeditation of the captors. The goal of this report is straightforward, to continue to support the claims of disappearances, abductions, forced conversions, and forced marriages of Coptic women in Egypt, and to continue to challenge the use of the term allegation in U.S. government reports. So how did, we, how did we get our information? Well, the findings are based on several key factors. First of all, we interviewed four Egyptian lawyers who provided us access to claims filed on behalf of Coptic women who had disappeared, as well as young women who had returned from a forced marriage and conversion and were attempting to regain their Christian identities. As we've already heard, the withholding of, of, um, of, one's, of one's original religion is a repetitive pattern. We also interviewed representatives of civil society organizations. We spoke with family members of young women who have disappeared. Some of these individuals were represented by attorneys. Many cannot afford an attorney and therefore come themselves. We reviewed internet sites reporting disappearances of Coptic girls, but we considered only those cases with appropriate documentation, especially police reports. And we interviewed women who have returned from, a, from forced marriage and con con conversion. All of our interviews were conducted from November 16th through November 25th, 2011, in and around Cairo, Egypt. Only verifiable cases are included in our report. Each of these cases is verifiable through attorney files, personal interviews, and police reports. The names of young women and their family members and other identifying details are not published to protect their identities. So what did we find that was a little bit different? Uh, we, we, we went in not quite knowing. We wanted to see if the political climate had changed anything. We wanted to see if the two years since our previous report had affected the situation anyway. We noticed some similarities and some marked differences. The first key finding is that the number of disappearances and abductions appear to be increasing. Each of the attorneys that we interviewed for this report indica indicated an increase in his caseload since January 2011. Four attorneys collectively report a total of over 550 cases of abductions, disappearances, and petitions to restore Christian identity following abductions, forced marriages, and forced conversions over a five-year period. Furthermore, one attorney interviewed for this report indicates firsthand knowledge of over 1,600 cases of Christians petitioning to have their conversions to Islam overturned in recent years. 60% over 900 women, 900 of these cases are women. Data collection, as in the trafficking world, remains a challenge. There is no systematic data repository within the Coptic community documenting the disappearances of young women. Priests or bishops keep records of activities within their churches and communities sometimes. Attorneys, may, attorneys maintain their own caseloads. Activists maintain different website, but there is no cross-referencing with other data sources. Furthermore, families of victims don't report all cases. The police do not register all complaints filed by family members. In many cases, family members of missing young women reported that police would not file a report until, until a lawyer intervened. In other cases, families don't file reports because they don't believe the claims will be taken seriously or because they fear retribution by the authorities. Not all families are financially able to secure the services of an attorney with and will not a guarantee of result, at least the presence of an attorney enables filing of a legitimate claim. We personally spoke to family members who would go to up to five or six different police stations before some police officer would finally agree to file a claim. These were dismissed uh, for all of the reasons that we've, that we've mentioned above. We're also noting that fewer girls appear to be returning to their families. 
Our 2009 report focused on young women who had returned from forced marriages and conversion and were struggling to regain their, identi their Christian identities. They report instances of abuse and forced domestic servitude. One woman reported being prostituted by her captor. Since then, there has been a discernible change in the dynamics of the disappearances of young Coptic women. Attorneys handling such cases report that fewer women are being returned to their families. There is speculation that the young women might be trafficked overseas, but attorneys and activists have not yet been able to document these findings, and we recommend that this trend be followed more seriously. We note that increasingly social media is being used to inform families about their daughter's conversions. One mother we spoke to told us that after looking for up to over six months to find news of her daughter, she happened to stumble upon a videotape of her announcing her conversion on a website of new converts to, uh, to Islam. Another deeply disturbing finding is that minors and mothers of young children are being targeted, uh, are being increasingly target, targeted. In addition to disappearances of single young women over the age of 18, lawyers report an increase in the abductions of mothers with young children. While the age of consent to convert to a different religion is 18 in Egypt, there are increasing reports that children of mothers who are forced to, con forced to convert are also subsequently rec uh, registered as Muslim. Even if a mother returns to her community, the children are considered by law to be Muslim and will remain Muslim. So in forcibly converting one young woman, all of her children will automatically be considered Muslim as well. The disappearances are organized and planned. We've seen this before, but we've received more corroborating evidence. Attorneys, social workers, and members of the clergy interviewed for this and the previous report all attest to the organized and systematic plan planning in the cases of missing Coptic women. Tactics to lure young women into relationships follow similar patterns. One lawyer interviewed for this report stated that the same man's name occurred in multiple police reports. He re married five Christian women who subsequently were forced to convert to Islam. So he would marry one, take her away, go back, work on another, get her converted, go back, work on another, and systematically pursue a number of forced conversions. Family members report that their daughters or sisters were befriended by a schoolmate, a neighbor, or another mother, an, an older mother figure over time. Uh, lawyers indicate that their clients benefited materially. Frequently, family members were provided with new apartments or furniture, and unemployable young men were given jobs uh, among the abductor families. Abductors target vulnerable women and girls, and girls in vulnerable and unprotected moments. The concluding observations of the UN's Commission on the Elimination of All Forms of Discrimination of Women for Egypt express concern at the very limited information and statistics provided about vulnerable groups of women in Egypt. Certainly, Coptic women and girls are vulnerable in many ways. They're members of a religious minority. They come from closed, insular communities. Their minority status is the basis for legal and social discrimination. Captors sever contact between victims and their families. The first task of the captor is to come between a young woman and members of her family. They can do this by force, by taking away her phone, by denying her any contact with her relatives. They lock her up. They deny her mobility. They threaten her, telling her that if, they, if she runs away, her family will never accept her, that they will punish her, that they will put her into a monastery. Eventually, a young woman is brainwashed and believes that she will be safe only with her Muslim captor. Ultimately, she will be truly safe only if she converts to Islam. There is no obligation for a Christian woman who marries a Muslim man to convert to Islam, so uh, many attorneys claim that this conversion is the ultimate goal of captivity. Captors make use of measures involving force, fraud, and coercion. A young woman consents to a glass of sugarcane juice and the attention of a man whose words promise a life of love, ease, and provision. Another woman shares a drink of water with a woman, another mother also waiting for her children after school. 
A third seeks friendship and escape from a harsh and sometimes abusive home environment. Victims who have not literally been abducted nevertheless did not consent to being ripped from their family without ever being able to see them again. They did not consent to being forcibly converted to a religion under the other than their own. They do not consent to a life of captivity within one small apartment, every outing supervised by a member of her new husband's family. They said yes to the things that young women say yes to. They say yes to friendship, to romance, to hope, a future, safety, and security. It is reasonable to accept that most young women would respond in precisely the same way as many Coptic girls responded to these offers of friendship and, for and romance, which proved to be highly destructive of their own lives. Now, about our recommendations. In developing these recommendations for this report, we consulted with attorneys and civil society actors in Egypt in order to assess what government actions might support their efforts to protect Coptic women from falling into captivity and as a result into forced marriages and conversions. There was considerable consensus among those that, taught, those that we spoke to. First, they would request that local police stations will take seriously and file all reports on all claims of disappearance of Coptic women and girls, and that all claims will be investigated and family members kept appraised of the progress of each of these cases. The Egyptian national government will request an annual accounting of all cases of disappearances, including open and ongoing cases, as well as any prosecutions that resulted from these local investigations. The Egyptian government will create a registry to document the disappearance of minors. Children of parents who convert will retain the religion of their birth until they are 18 years old. Laws which penalize discrimination based on religion in the areas of education, employment, and media will be enacted. To the Coptic Church, the, the activists would like to suggest that the church maintain a central registry documenting instances of disappearance, abductions, and forced marriages and conversions that is laid out according to a rigorous methodology which can document the instances without sensationalism. The Coptic community will educate families and young women on the recruitment and deception patterns that led to captivity. And for the international community, the recommendations are that a legal defense fund would be created to enable Coptic families to secure the presence of an attorney, which, as we indicated, is frequently the only way to get a case legally registered as a disappearance. International or national agencies assessing the situation of Coptic women in Egypt will recognize that coercion and fraud are represented in most cases of disappearance, forced marriages, and forced conversion, all of which obviate the consent of the victim. And finally, my last, the, the, the recommendation that ended my last testimony to you, Mr. Chairman, that international organizations and our own government will recognize both the scope and the scale of the problem and no longer refer to such cases as allegations. I don't think that anyone will refer to the witness we will hear later as an allegation. Mr. Chairman and members of the Commission, I thank you for your time and interest in this very important matter. I look forward to answering your questions. <laughs>